Tonight's big stories, a failure of intelligence. The armed forces says they may very well have committed that in last Sunday's deadly bomb attack in Marawi. SMNI anchors Jeffrey Celis and Lorraine Badoy have initiated a hunger strike to protest their detention. We'll be speaking with Surigao del Sur representative Johnny Pimentel about this, as well as the future of the network. And it's all systems go for the December 10 Christmas voyage to the West Philippine Sea. We will be giving you an inside look at all the pack donations and behind the scenes preparations. Welcome to the show. I'm Regina Lay. I'm Gretchen Ho. And I'm Sean Yao. The Armed Forces of the Philippines has admitted there's a possibility that there was indeed a failure of intelligence that led to the Marawi blast. Recall that the attack killed four people and injured nearly four dozen others. Some of the survivors gathered today for the first mass since that fateful Sunday. Jenny Dongon has the big story tonight. These were the emotional scenes we witnessed inside this small classroom in Mindanao State University in Marawi. This group gathered for a mass service, the first since the deadly explosion last December 3, which also happened during a mass service. Some of those who graced today's mass are students and residents who were inside the gymnasium when the blast took place. Around 200 people usually attend the masses at MSU, but today only around 20 were present. One of the victims was Nane Drusilia, who survived the attack, despite the bomb being placed just behind her. Nane Drusilia sustained some minor injuries. She admits, though, that there are wounds that will not heal quickly. And those are from the guilt she's feeling over the attack, noting that she was the one who arranged the sitting during the weekend mass. Guilty din ako kay last na pinapupo ko sabi niya ma'am pwede ba na uh, sabi ko doon sabi niya dito lang sa malapit di sabi ko dito nandoon pala ang bomba sa ang bag ng bomba sa baba ng kanyang upuan Bishop Edwin de la Peña says terrorists will not shake their fate Huwag nating payagan na manalo sila no at sasabihin nila na nanalo kami sa nangyari no nobody wins in an act of violence, nobody wins in war. Lahat tayo talunan sa, sa gyera, no? So, manatila lang tayong kalmado. The Armed Forces of the Philippines is looking at the possibility of failure of intelligence in the deadly bombing. They say this may have been a factor as to how the suspects were able to carry out the attack. Wala naman kasing perfect na intelligence operations mm -hmm. or masabihin na natin pagkolekta ng informasyon. Mm -hmm. Pwedeng may informasyon na hindi nakarating. Pwedeng nagkamali ka sa pag-process ng information. Sa amin, ang tinitingnan natin is ano ba ang mga informasyon na available during the time. Mm -hmm. Nagawa ba ng mga sundalo natin o mga operatiba natin yung dapat gawin. Kung meron mga information, saan tayo nagkamali? So these are part of the investigation mm -hmm. para at least ma- the AFP said that aside from their investigation, they are also focusing on heightening the security in Marawi City to ensure that attacks like this will not happen again. For News 5, Jenny Dongon, We Are One News. And following that Marawi blast, airports, bus terminals and ports are now on heightened alert in preparation for the holidays. The Coast Guard has even deployed bomb experts to prevent similar attacks from happening. Other PCG assets that have been prepared to secure the holiday season are rescue equipment and high-caliber firearms. These assets were inspected earlier today by Transportation Secretary Jimmy Bautista ahead of the holiday rush. These will be deployed to terminals, ports and airports all over the country from December 15 to January next year. Bostista says the possibility of attacks like that in Marawi is, quote, always a concern. Kaya nga, uh, nagre-ready tayo for uh, any eventuality. No? Uh, nakita nyo naman yung, uh, yung uh, mga facilities ng course, Coast Guard, yung ating uh, mga personnel uh, who are trained. For example, uh, meron tayong mga bomb experts. No? Uh, nakita nyo kanina. No? Uh, so even yung kanilang... Uh, 
mga suot ay uh, talaga namang specialized no? to see to it that they are also protected. Meanwhile, over in our seas, the Philippine Coast Guard has rescued five Filipino fishermen whose boat was destroyed after an alleged elision with a Chinese bulk carrier in waters near Palawan, Occidental Mindoro on Tuesday. An elision is when one vessel crashes or runs into another that is stationary. Now, according to the PCG, the FBCA Ruel J was reportedly anchored and attached to a fishing payao when it was suddenly hit by the cargo ship MV Tai Hang 8. Now, instead of providing assistance, the cargo vessel reportedly <coughs> left the five Filipino fishermen floating at sea. The fishermen were eventually rescued after seeking help on social media. The rescued fishermen were identified as Jun Ray Sardan, Brian J. Daus, Brian Pangat Pangatungam, Christian Arizala, and Joshua Barbas. The five fishermen are now in stable condition after receiving safety checkups and medical aid. Now up next, the House Committee on Franchises closes in on SMNI, which they're charging with several violations. We'll be speaking with Committee Vice Chairman Johnny Pimentel about the future of the network right after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. You're still watching the big story here on One News. Our other big story tonight, SMNI program anchors Jeffrey Salas and Lorraine Badoy underwent medical checkups over at the House of Representatives after going on a hunger strike. Lawmakers had cited Badoy and Salas in contempt for acting in a disrespectful manner and refusing to answer questions during an inquiry. Celis refused to give up his source on the travel expenses of Speaker Martin Rualdez, while Badoy confused the House panel on her answers regarding her role as producer and host, as well as the number of advertisements in their program. The two are now detained at the Batasang Pambansa. SMNI said it will appeal the contempt order on Monday to secure the release of its two anchors. The committee will reportedly vote on the matter. And if the committee does not support their cause, they will be compelled to file a petition with the Supreme Court to challenge the detention and arrest of Celis and Badoy. Kung may violation man, at least i-comply ang bigyan ng pagkakataon na i-comply yun. And, and kung assuming na, na mali yun, at least may due process pa rin. But in this case, hindi namin na... Hindi natin na, na avail yung due process na kailangan ng ating ng SMNI. Pagi ko naman po in eh, I our records will bear us out. Uh, due process was definitely accorded to them. They were every time that they wanted to speak, they were given that privilege. As long as you know they are they were recognized accordingly. 
here tonight to speak about the ongoing hearing. We have with us Surigao del Sur Representative Johnny Pimentel. He is also the Vice Chair of the House Committee on Legislative Franchises. Good evening, Congressman. Welcome to The Big Story. Thanks for being here. Yes, good evening, uh, Gretchen, Sean, and Regina, and your televiewers. Uh, Congressman, um, see, Attorney Rolex Suplico was actually our guest last night. And so the first thing I wanted to ask you was, sabi niya, he wasn't being heard during the hearings, that all the questions that were being thrown at him were yes or no questions and that he's not being given a chance to explain or give context now. Uh, is that accurate? First and foremost, uh, we have a house rule in the conduct of uh, committee hearings that the resource person or any member of the committee can only speak when he is recognized by the chairman. In this case, uh, probably he, uh, he was not recognized by the chairman, so he was not allowed to speak. And of course, yes, there were questions that were asked by yes or no. And uh, he was not allowed to explain because we just want to establish some facts and minabuti uh, na rin ang chairman na tanungin lang sila ng yes or no. Alright, uh, Rep. Johnny, sa Monday, uh, ang susunod na kabanata, no? at inaabangan nating lahat. Um, uh, what can we expect in Monday's hearing? Uh, can we expect also to hear more from the Council of SMNI? Yes, actually, uh, we are hearing their side, no? But uh, let me first uh, tell you what has happened in the past two hearings. Uh, we had a hearing last November 30 and last uh, December 5. Now, in these two hearings, we were able to establish that uh, Suara Su, who is the operator of SMNI, has violated some provisions in Republic Act uh, 11422, uh, which is their uh, franchise most specifically Section 4, Section 10, Section 11, Section 12. Now, Section 4 uh, deals with the responsibility of the franchise holder with the, to the public. No, So it states there that the grantee shall not use their station to disseminate false information to the detriment of public interest. Now, uh, the hearing was conducted because uh, in one of their programs, they accused the speaker of spending 1.8 billion pesos in traveling expenses. And during the hearing, uh, we invited several resource persons and they testified that uh, Speaker Romualdez only spent 4.3 million pesos as, uh, for the traveling expenses. And uh, the House of Representatives only spent uh, 35 million pesos uh, for a total of 39 million pesos, which is a far cry from their allegations of 1.8 billion pesos. And in the course of our hearing, uh, Mr. Raselis admitted that his source was wrong. And uh, in Amin Dimpunya, na nagkamali siya, and I even asked him if he was willing to recount his testimony and apologize to Congress, and he said yes. Mm -hmm. So that is one ground. The other ground is uh, by Section 10, which is the sale, transfer, assignment of uh, their franchise. Now, we also found out that through the years, uh, uh, Suara Sub has already changed ownership. Now, under Section 10, uh, any franchise holder should ask permission from Congress if they, pl if they plan to sell any uh, uh, or if there is a change of ownership but in this case they did not do so and in fact mm -hmm. under the section 10 ipso facto if they violated that section they will be revoked meaning yeah. automatic po ang revocation yeah. now on, um, yeah. section 11 this is very important Sorry, Congressman, Congressman, sorry, sorry. Before we move on, sorry, I apologize. I have to interrupt you because uh, we did ask Attorney Rolex Suplico last night those exact two questions, and I have his answers. Number one, his answer to the violation of Section 4, is, he says, 
everyone makes mistakes. Na kuryente lang sila. And the proper uh, thing to do would have been to charge them with libel instead of taking it to a congressional hearing. Mm -hmm. And his answer to Section 10 violation is he says, yung oh, change, of ownership, yung change of ownership that was below 50%. Can I have your response to both of that, please? We have already, Section 4, uh, sinabi siya, nangkabli sila, but there has already been a pattern in the past. They have been using SMNI to spread false information. In fact, they're facing right now nine cases in different bodies. They have cases in uh, KBP, they have cases in MTRCB, they have cases in NTC, they have cases in Ombudsman, they have cases in the Court of Law, all pertaining to dissemination of false uh, 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 information, accusing uh, people uh, by using false information. So there has been already a series of incidents proving that in... Okay. Uh, looks like we have some uh, technical difficulties at mm -hmm. the moment. Yes, hello, Cong uh, Congressman Johnny. Are you still there? We're going to try to get him back on the line. Uh, sayang lang, it just, uh, just when he was uh, mm -hmm. trying to address the questions that were raised. Um, because uh, the question here, I think, is the, the gravity of the punishment the same? Mm, correct, exactly. Well, I think, I we, think do we have, have back. We do we have uh, Rep. Johnny back. Um, Congressman, yes, uh, regarding the Section 10 uh, issue because uh, last night, Attorney Suplico did say, ang um, sinabi niya po no, is uh, below 50% daw and that's the reason why Congress was not informed. Mm. Um, what exactly does the rule say? Um, may ganun po bang rule na it's mm. only pag 50% and above tsaka kayo kailangan um, timbrehan, kumbaga? Well, you know what? Uh, every lawyer has his own interpretation of the law, no? Uh, iba-ibang abogado, iba-ibang interpretasyon ng ating batas. But it is very clear there, any change of ownership must be uh, permitted by Congress. In short, kailangan humingi muna sila ng permiso bago nila ibenta yung prangkisa. In this case, uh, sabi ko nga, they were in, 16, in existence for 25 years, then not... They were renewed in 2019, so four years have already passed. Sa 25 years na yung unang prangkisa nila, wala silang ni-report. Uh, yung bagong prangkisa nila, apat na taon na, wala rin silang ni-report. Pero inami nila uh, during the last hearing na indeed there was already a change of ownership. So sila rin naman ang umamin uh, na there was already a change of ownership. And then, well... Uh, uh, can attorney Suplico answer this? What about the violation of Section 11, the dispersal of ownership? Uh, it states there that... Uh... Mm -hmm. ah, the chairs of the yes. All right, yes. um, Congressman, ito, puntahan po natin si uh, Jeffrey Ceres and Lorraine Badoy. They are still both in detention going on hunger strike. Until when do you plan to keep them there in detention? And is that really necessary um, given the state of things? The motion that was approved is that they will be detained until such time that the committee report will be adopted in the plenary. So, wala pa po to tayong committee report. I don't know if it will be presented on, uh, on Monday. If, uh, if there will be a committee report on Monday, then we will approve it in the committee level. Then it will have to go to committee rules. Then it will be a calendar for business sa plenario po. Now, we only have three days um, before we go on recess. So, I really cannot give you a timeline when they will be detained. If the... A committee report will not be approved, then they will have to be detained until we resume session on January 22. However, they can appeal or they can request the committee for a for law, considering that it is a Christmas holidays, but they have to write uh, to the committee officially requesting for a for law, meaning this will be only be temporary. After the for law, one session will open on the new January 22. They will go. They will have to go back to the detention uh, center 
at to the detention room in the premises of Congress. Alright, so pwede naman pala sila mag-apply for furlough no, during the holidays kasi medyo matagal po, uh, especially if they're gonna insist on their hunger strike. Now, uh, going back to uh, Jeffrey Celis, no, uh, Rep. Johnny, sabi niya kasi uh, he suggested that this whole detention issue is not really about the legislative franchise of SMNI, but rather a broader issue of abuse of power by the House of Representatives. What do you have to say about that? It's not an abuse of power. He violated uh, two sections of our House rules uh, under section... We have House rules with regards to conduct of inquiries in aid of legislation. Now, in section 11, uh, contempt, the committee can uh, cite for contempt a resource person with two-thirds vote on six grounds, no? Now, on Section 11, Paragraph C, a person can be cited for contempt for refusal to answer questions relevant to the inquiry, which he violated. He did not want to reveal his source. He was asked four times. He also violated Section E which is being disrespectful to the members of the committee and misbehaving. It was very clear on the outset of the hearing that uh, he was not following uh, rules. In fact, he, even though he is not recognized, salita ng silita, he was even taunting the committee to cite him for contempt. He was uh, misbehaving. He was very disrespectful to the committee and that is a ground for him to be cited for contempt. Okay, Congressman, is it um, only revocation of the franchise on a television that you are looking into? How about the social media platforms of SMNI? We are not talking yet about revocation. Mm -hmm. What my statement said, there could be a big possibility that could be revoked. What happened in the December 5 uh, um, uh, hearing is that we passed a resolution urging National Telecommunication Commission mm -hmm. to suspend the operations of uh, SMNI or Suara Sub. Yung palong po, because there has no, be, no uh, bill filed yet for the revocation of the franchise. But based on the findings of the committee, there is already grounds for them to be revoked. Sorry, Congressman, can I just clarify? Uh, we thought that Representative Margarita Nograles has already filed a bill seeking she to revoke the... a resolution, I okay, believe. Okay, so re resolution. It's yeah. not a bill oh, yet. Uh, okay. It was a resolution mm -hmm. urging National Telecommunication okay. Commission to suspend the operations of SMNI. There, was, there is no bill yet filed. Uh, with regards to the revocation, uh, revocation of the franchise. But will there be a bill, uh, as far as you know, Congressman? Is someone, uh, some member of Congress currently working on the bill, as far as you know? Well, there are talks that the, there might be a bill filed next week, but I cannot really say for sure, but there is talk uh, going around in Congress that there might be a bill filed uh, next week. Will this be pending what happens on uh, Monday's hearing? Well... The, 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 the filing of uh, or the bill revoking the franchise will have to be another hearing because it is another matter, no? Um, so yung on Monday, that is only a continuation of the past two hearings to clarify some things. And uh, uh, again, the resource persons are invited, including Celis and um, uh, uh, Badoy. Now, maybe in, during that hearing, they might appeal, no? Uh, we really don't know what's going to happen. But there are some things that needs to be asked, needs to be clarified. We have invited uh, BIR. We have invited AMLA. This was uh, because of the statement of uh, Lauren Badoy that they have no advertisers, that there was no income of uh, the, their program. However, apart from verification of their uh, financial statement, mm -hmm. we found out that they have been earning uh, my income sila. Eh, saan ang galing yung income nila? Sabi ni Batoy, wala raw advertisers. Pero sabi naman ng financial statement, eh, merong income for the past how many years? So we will have to ask the BIR, we will have to ask AMLA also, 
regarding the funds that have come in uh, to their account. And are you still also pushing to find out who the source is of uh, Celis uh, when he claimed that the speaker had that 1.8 billion peso travel expense? Yes, you still we want will the answer pursue to that. that. Uh, pero anyway, it's not an academic because uh, Celis has already been cited for contempt. However, if we reveal the source, then the contempt could be lifted. All right, uh, let's uh, play a game of uh, supposing. Uh, Rep. Johnny, since you are the Vice Chairman of the Legislative Franchises Committee in the House, let's just say that SMNI's franchise does get revoked. Uh, what then happens to the franchise? Uh, will it be up for someone else to apply for that franchise? No, it's revoked. Same as ABCBN, uh, ABCN was not renewed. The franchise was uh, not given to anyone. Uh, 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 remember that a franchise is not a right, it is only a privilege given by the state through Congress. So therefore, uh, since Congress has the power to grant a franchise, Congress also has the power to amend or to repeal. But once a franchise is revoked, tapos na yun. It cannot be given to anyone or other it's because it's already revoked. Mm -hmm. So if any entity would like to have a mm -hmm. franchise, they will have to apply for a new franchise. Uh, Congressman, yung uh, ibig sabihin katulad ng ABS-CBN, uh, will SMNI still be able to run their network online? Um, kasi alam po natin, no, marami po silang napopost online. Yes, because online, uh, yung viral. franchise lang naman yung mm -hmm. nirevoke natin. Eh. All right. Yung uh, sa social media nila is a different matter. Okay, uh, Congressman, lastly, uh, I I, I a question, but, uh, you know, Lorraine Badoy also had a statement where she mentioned the infiltration of the CPP, NPA, NDF inside Congress. Can I just ask what you made of that? Uh, that is not true. That is really false. And that is why I've been telling you, they have always been uh, spreading false information. That she has proof, that she has proof, that she has evidence that... Uh, Congress has been infiltrated by uh, by the communists. Uh, there is no truth to that matter. And that is why I've been saying they are always in violation of Section 4. They have always been spreading false information. Kagaya niyan, accusing us, uh, accusing Congress, infiltrated by CCP, CPP, and the FNP, far from the truth. Okay. Well, we're going to uh, closely monitor the hearings on Monday. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights tonight. So, regard Del Sur Representative Johnny Pimentel. Thank you. We're pausing for a quick break right now, but after that, the country's unemployment rate fell in October while employment rose to its highest since April 2005. We'll break down the good news for you right after this. Stay with us.
Welcome back. You're still watching The Big Story here in One News. Some good economic news to chew on. The country's employment rate is on the up. Data from the Philippine Statistics Authority show that employment rate in October at 95.8%. That's equivalent to 47 million Filipinos with jobs, slightly higher than the figures from September this year and October last year. That's the highest since April 2005. The unemployment rate also slightly eased to 4.2% in October, down year on year and from the figure in September. Underemployment, however, remains high at 11.7%, higher than the previous months. That means there were more people looking for additional jobs during that time to augment their income. National statistician Dennis Mapa said the accommodation and food service activity sector added the most jobs, as is typical during the holiday season. Well, what about the tech industry? Can we ramp up hiring over there? A report published by venture capital firm Gobi Core Philippine Fund showed that startup founders still face several challenges to this day. Let's talk about that now with Gobi Core Philippines founding partner Carlo Chen de Lantar. Good evening, Carla. Thank you for joining us. Good evening. Good evening, ladies. Hi, Gretchen, Regina, and Sean. Thank you for having me. All right, uh, we did get a copy of your uh, very extensive report, but we want to hear it from you. How is the fundraising scene in the Philippines post-COVID pandemic? Where are we at this point? Thanks for the question. So I think the past 2021-2022 was really the rise of at least proof of concept that uh, the Philippines have fundable tech startups. No. Uh, unfortunately, this year, um, because of cost of capital and the, the possible recession in, in the U.S. and its implications to the global market. We're seeing total raised funds in the Philippines go down as low as 50% compared to last year. Uh, in terms of deal counts, which means the amount of um, uh, fundraising rounds close or fundraised successfully, it's down 21%. And in terms of the amount uh, these startups fundraise has uh, also corrected down to 37%. So. It's a bit cheaper now, um, but it, it also shows that, you know, startups are also struggling with all the macro issues that's happening globally. Well, Carlo, where are we seeing a lot of growth? Uh, tell us all about the startup market. Um, I, I mean, um, what, what, what is working um, here in the Philippines? Cool. So when we look at the, the tech ecosystem as Gobi Core, um, we measure the tech ecosystem in three Three areas. No? We call it the Iron Triangle. It was dubbed by uh, Jack Ma from Alibaba. So the Iron Triangle consists of three industries that make up a robust uh, tech ecosystem. That's finance, uh, e-commerce, and logistics. So with that, you can see if things are uh, becoming healthy in that space, more industries, uh, whether that's uh, D2C, whether that's tourism, it could be everything in between healthcare, uh, education comes in and be becomes part of it now. So um, we're seeing that uh, B2B businesses in the tech side has definitely become a big one. E-commerce is also another thing. Uh, mainly, if you think about during the pandemic, over 10,000 e-commerce uh, SMEs that went to the e-commerce platforms immediately became millionaires uh, because of the total accessible market to them now. So we're seeing a lot of retail and wholesale, but we see, still see a lot more upside when, when it comes to health, education, entertainment, all the way to logistics, which is the missing piece on the Iron Triangle. Well, actually, I wanted to ask you about logistics because you had quite a lot of slides on that. I'm talking about uh, actual logistics on the ground, which you need to fulfill, I, I suppose, when you're doing a... Uh, startup businesses like this. Uh, one of the main issues that you addressed was... Of course, public infrastructure. Um, having said that, we are, of course, an archipelago. So it that just makes everything a lot more difficult. Uh, Especially last-mile logistics. Exactly. Uh, and we know that there are a lot mm -hmm. of uh, businesses doing that right now. Um, is there still any upside? Uh, without, of course, having to rely on a government to finish building, because we are a bit delayed, I think, uh, with the uptake on infra. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. So logistics is the missing piece for the tech ecosystem to become completely robust outside of the government support. No. 
So when you look at logistics, our, uh, being an archipel uh, archipelagic country, it comes with its own challenges. That's number one. Number two, when you look at uh, last mile logistics, we are one of the most expensive in the region. Uh, number three, when you look at the infrastructure, point to point, sometimes it's easy, it's cheaper to send a container from Cebu to Singapore than Cebu to Manila. Your, uh, our, our, uh, if there's an e-commerce seller from Cebu that wants to send to Mindanao, there's a highly chance that it will go to Manila first, then go back to Mindanao. So the real question here is, how do you create an e-commerce roadmap supported by uh, DTI and uh, NEDA and all the infrastructure to talk now? Uh, the only pushback, uh, the only hard part about uh, logistics, although there's a lot of upside there, is the question of infrastructure building, no? whether if, if it's a startup going to invest in that or the government. It's very, very hard, but I do think there are um, um, bright spots. Uh, one thing I would I would recommend immediately is asking all the ports to have the same standards and, and forms to make it easier and way more efficient. As you know, logistics, it's all about efficiency and timing. No? Mm -hmm. The faster you give it to uh, to send it and receive, the, the better the performance and also um, uh, reliance and uh, uh, approval of consumers. But uh, I feel like over the last, uh, well, three, four years, there has been a lot of venture capital money that's gone into logistics, a lot of foreign investors that's gone into logistics, uh, whether you talk about warehousing or last mile logistics. Um, are they making enough headway or are they running to, into a lot of problems on the ground? And do you feel like they're going to stick it out in the long run? They have to. I think uh, the whole ecosystem is relying on that. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's a market share game. So there's enough for everyone. Um, as you know, majority of the the uh, GMB and sales of a lot of these startups that are especially let's talk about e-commerce, right? Uh, you're looking at most of them coming from NCR, but we haven't really um, really uh, fulfilled or completely tapped the whole market of secondary and third cities, right? Mm -hmm. That's majority of the market share, if done right. So um, everyone's doing their part. Uh, you have other logistics tech companies that are trying different models where before it would be big warehouses as hubs, but now you're looking at uh, independent contractors, uh, whether that's a house or a kubo as, a, as an entry or pickup point. Um, and I think that's, that's the beauty of startups, right? Uh, you can be asset light, you could be innovative and you know, using the culture of Filipinos, I think that's that's going to happen regardless. Well, uh, I, I would also like to ask if there's anything we can learn from the Indonesian experience. I saw some graphs there and they have like outdone us by a lot. Um, they are, of course, a bigger archipelago with a bigger population. And is it possible even with the Philippine framework and regulations to be able to copy mm. the model in Indonesia? I love that question so much. Uh, I really think if you're talking about ASEAN, everyone, everyone's golden star is Indonesia. And what's worked really well for Indonesia is big population, uh, big, robust, in, uh, yeah. intense and passionate government support helping the tech ecosystem. And that could happen in the Philippines. No? It's only a matter of time. So I think that's the reason why we created this report, because we wanted to show what type of founders or startups can be funded in the Philippines now. So we've, we've done a sample of it, and it's great to see, you know, the, 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 the profile of a founder here. But it shows from that we can say, let's raise the standard, the minimum standard in the Philippines throughout the archipelago and say, if we do this right, and if we can support them based on the specific profile of a funded startup in the Philippines, then we could become Indonesia. We could also become Vietnam, which is closer to us. Vietnam is probably two to three years ahead of us, but Indonesia, I would say, is about five to seven years ahead of us. So there's a lot of upside, but the question is, okay, where do we start? And that's the reason why we created this report for the ecosystem by the ecosystem. Well, Carla, talk to us about government support. How um, in are they, uh, are they in on this? And you've been investing uh, in startups uh, for many, many years. Uh, Talk us through what you see in 2024. Give us a forecast. Uh, what could probably be the next unicorn out there? Oh, great, great question. So um, I, I love talking about this part because I do think that the government, so there are three main government agencies that are mandated by the government to 
uh, to support startups. That's uh, Department of Trade of Industry, uh, DOST, and the ICP, right? Mm -hmm. Over the past uh, two, three years, uh, they've uh, deployed over $11.4 million. That's about 627 million pesos towards the startup development and also funding. So it's gotten, uh, as we all know, when government comes in and they're enforced, it's never zero to 100 in a year. Mm -hmm. It's zero to 10, 10 to 35, 35 to 70, and so forth. So we see that now, and they're actually the first ones that support startups at an idea stage, development stage. So we created a funding landscape actually to help with that. Uh, now, our goal now is we want to close in the gap. No? The Philippines has been called a nascent ecosystem, meaning that you have some winners, but sometimes not really. There's not too many competition when a startup in an industry, maybe three to five, but never 10 to 15 like Indonesia. So when we look at this, we say, okay, what's next? No, um, I think 2024 is going to be a tough year. Uh, cost of capital, you're 100 pesos for a startup. You can only spend 75 pesos of that. Multiple factors there. And I think um, we will see new startups that understand this. This is also a proving ground for 2024 if the startup uh, ecosystem can handle the trade wins, whether bad or good, right? Um, so I think uh, the real question is what's going to happen after 2024? That's where we're excited because the only, the only thing that's missing in the Philippines, we never, we've never caught a break, you know? Pandemic happened, then this inflation recession is happening. But if we had three years to thrive, uh, no doubt we'll have a couple of unicorns popping out whether and my dream is to have some unicorns or better uh, successes in Visayas Mindanao because I see technology as a nation building uh, uh, platform for a lot of uh, Filipinos. Uh, just a quick, in there. Uh, I know, just a quick uh, addition to what Gretchen asked. Uh, we all know the new administration which began last year. Uh, they are embracing this whole digital digitalization, uh, all of this uh, a startup world or the whole ecosystem has that helped any or do you notice any change because of the change in administrations and also like are we is our startup industry buffered from the constant changes now through administration i was also thinking yeah. that the pandemic might have set us up for mm -hmm. for digitalization i mean mm -hmm. more developments there because we did we were forced mm -hmm. to 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 we, adapt yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. So um, we're seeing, we're, we're we're feeling and seeing the the new administration really contributing to this. I think the most important one, significant update this year was that uh, NEDA has created a national innovation council, um, and I think that's really crucial because innovation as its tool, we're seeing both public representatives but also the private sector that's coming in. So they created a a council for that. So we're being heard. Uh, but we also have to remember when this kicks in, this is the exciting part. We need to make sure all the safeguards are in place. No, uh, we are heard, private private uh, sector, but also the public sector comes in. Now, the beauty of being in the Philippines is both, uh, you could look at it as a uh, bad thing or a good thing, but for me, it's a silver lining. No? The Philippines is late in, in the ASEAN tech ecosystem race. We're not competing with that, right? Uh, the, goal, the, the way I see it is let's learn from all their failures, their wins, completely localize it here, and then we don't have to make those same mistakes. No? I think that's, that's very, very exciting uh, in our space because Filipinos are global. Uh, we call it in, in Gobi Core, uh, Philippines to the world. 60% of our total um, industry is co completely services. If you go all around the, the world, there's always a Filipino, whether that's entertainment, where, whether that's health, and so forth. So the question is, how can that uh, be used as a way to support the Philippines? No? Technology is perfect for it. And that's, that's what we've seen with startups like Kumu, uh, Tier 1, and so forth. And uh, that's really exciting because Filipinos, we always want to come back home. Right. Uh, right? Uh, remittances, OFWs come back here. So there's a lot of upside there. All right. On that good note, we're going to have to leave it there and check back in with you on next year's report. Thank you so much for your time tonight. Carlo Chen Delantar, Gobi Core Philippine Fund founding partner.
Final preparations are underway for the Christmas convoy to the West Philippine Sea slated to start on December 10. Donations wrapped in Christmas boxes and ribbons are now ready for the long voyage to the Kalayaan group of islands. Sacks of rice, canned goods, Noche Buena packs, hygiene kits, toys, solar lamps, and even statues in the, uh, of the figures in the Christmas Belen will make their way to our soldiers and fishing communities in the West Philippine Sea. Ito nakikita ninyo ngayon uh, that is in the... Uh, at in ito headquarters in Quezon City. Of course, we have also the MVP Group Foundations mm -hmm. donating to that. Mm -hmm. um, solar lamps, also yung uh, Noche Buena Pax Mula mm -hmm. Ability Smart Foundation. And uh, toys uh, for, for, the, for kids the kids to uh, enjoy. Now, the mother vessel with a capacity of at least 130 persons will be carrying both donations and volunteers and will set sail from Manila to Palawan tomorrow in the morning. The three-day Christmas voyage officially begins on December 10. That is International Human Rights Day, where civilian boats and Philippine Coast Guard vessels will be joined by 38 fishing boats. The convoy is expected to sail by the general vicinity of the hotly contested Ayungin Shoal, where the BRP Sierra Madre is stationed. It will make a stopover in the Patag and Lawak Islands, but donations are expected to reach all seven islands of the Kalayaan Group, as well as fisher folk communities in Zambales, Morong Bataan, and Subic. While there are risks of confrontation with the Chinese Coast Guard, fisherman Ruperto Alerosa, who came all the way from Batangas, and will be joining the convoy, had this to say. May nagtanong nga sa akin, hindi ba kayo natatakot? Ay, sino bang hindi matatakot? Pero sabi ko, hindi ba rin matakot? Huwag lang maduwag. At mas nakakatakot, yung agawang ka ng iyong sariling bansa. Bansa, hindi yung... Ang inaagaw dito, hindi lang naman uh, territorial waters. Eh. Kapag sila yung nagtagumpay doon, buong bansa aagaw nila. Mas nakakatakot yun. Yes, guess siya? who else is going to be on that convoy? Mo siya sa you. Convoy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so ko siya. we'll miss you for a few days. Yes, uh, hopefully I come back. Um, in one piece? <laughs> <laughs> with presents for you, you guys. Okay. I know, a, 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 a vial of uh, West Philippine sea water. Pwede, pwede. Okay. Or sand. Kasi yes. bawal yung sand. Never know until souvenir. Regina, pwede. bawal yung sand. Ay, oh nga pala, sorry. Oh, the water is a vial <laughs> of West Philippine sea water. Hindi, <laughs> pero alam mo, um, de, bukod doon, kanina na nakakwento niya sa akin, ano, may hmm. mga sumbong daw. Kasi siya national chairperson siya nung mm -hmm. ating mga At, ano, mangingisda. Mm -hmm. Ang sabi niya, inaagawan din daw ng huli yung fishermen ah, yeah. natin in Bajo de Masinloc. Meaning nahuli na, tapos kukunin yung nahuli na? Yes, nahuli na, tapos nilalapitan sila tas and they're being threatened. My Kinatakot. gosh, parang ano, no? bully, oh, sa, okay. bully sa playground. Ganun. Yun, ganun. Uh -huh. no? so, so they appreciate, uh, kaya they're joining in on the convoy. Sabi nila, kung pinagtatanggol kami ng iba, we have to be here. And that's why there will be 38 fishing boats joining yeah. the convoy. But the problem is, you know, hopefully I can talk to you guys because we don't know how the weather is gonna be. Yeah. Also the signal. We're gonna mm -hmm. try gonna though. Struggle. You guys will <laughs> try <laughs> as usual. We're gonna, wait, we're gonna wait. try to connect yes. to you guys over there. Nagalay ka na ba ng itlog? Hindi pa. Ayun, mamaya. Kailangan mo yan. And then also, just to be clear, you're not, uh, you're you're only passing within the vicinity yes. of the BRP Sierra Madre. Yes, because that Sierra was the condition of oh, the oh. National Security Correct. Council. Correct. Because they did not allow this initially, but mm. uh, there were negotiations. And said, okay, we will just have visibility of the BRP Sierra Madre, and that is fine. Tadaanan lang. Tapos yung Patag and Lawak, those are islands that are near to each other. So, doon kami pupunta. We'll see if uh, um, we can Alam drop off to the communities yeah. there. Alam ko na anong pwede niyong pasalubo. Ano pa? Pictures na lang. Ayun, eh, pwede, pwede. Kasi di, di naman tayo makakapunta right? doon. Right? Oh, oh. Oh. Yeah, some of my friends have been asking for a video right? live from the West Philippine Sea. So we'll... Okay. We'll I, know Gretchen, the weekend. I know Gretchen will... Send off to an adventure. <laughs> we will report that. We'll try to connect to you guys at each step of the way. And definitely, we will be praying for you and for good weather. But before we go, meron pa tayo, no? Ang big picture natin tonight. Now, this is one couple that is extending their chapter further. Wala pa tayo sa epilogue. And I'm talking about none other than former President Joseph Estrada with his wife, former Senator Loy, celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary on Wednesday. The couple's youngest son, Jude, posted this photo on Instagram showing his parents, both in white and smiling happily on their special day. The two tied the knot in a civil ceremony back in 1959 and have three children together.
So this is not chapter not closed. Not, not this one. Not, not yet. <laughs> not this I one. Mean, I, I, I saw you know, Jose Marie Chan yesterday in an, an event. That's why I wasn't here. Mm -hmm. And um, he was singing everybody a perfect Christmas. And yeah. he was also singing this love song that he composed and wrote for his wife. He's 78 years old now. Wow. Oh my you know, um, ends up in tears every now and then. He gets emotional. I said, na ako. As the years go by, I get more emotional. So I, he looks quite young still, huh? Yeah, he doesn't look no, 70. I know like my head was stuck on 60s. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, I cannot forget it because it, it felt like you know, he had such um, um, uh, so much love for mm. his wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for the... Parang sabi niya, yung mga anak namin, wala na sa bahay. Mm. Empty nesters na kami. Oh. Magkakasama na kami ngayon and we have each other to love. It reminds me of... Uh, In short, there them. is forever. Yes, May forever. It forever reminds naman. me of forever. On that note, that's it for the show on this Thursday night. <laughs> it is a long weekend. It is. Not for us, but, <laughs> but we will be here tomorrow night too, so stay tuned for that. At least we have, you know, forever, not just in love, but also in EDSA because it is... Well, next, <laughs> equal card na yan. Equal card na yan. But I won't be experiencing that in the seas. Fortunately, we are one who's all sides all the time. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night.